Every time Chef Gorodin touched his penis, he knew the devil was hiding inside it. It didn't take much. A bump of his crotch against a shopping cart, a dog's prodding nose, rubbing his groin on a pew as he squeezed past a churchgoer, and Satan would holler, Do it again, Chef! Chef belonged to the Catholic Church, which vilified the body as an intruder on the soul. The soul, Chef believed, was the eternal part of the human being, while the body was Satan's temporary meat, which he brined in temptation. Eternal though it may be, the soul had little sway over the desires of the body. Every time he succumbed to the temptation of onanism, he broke down and prayed, Please God, let that be the last time I ever make my body feel good. Chef warped and disfigured his faith until it lent credibility to his every inkling. When he craved food throughout the day, that was the devil filling him with carbs. He was a rampant nail chewer, which represented the devil's need to swallow fingernails. The devil was why he watched too much TV and why he never cleaned his bathroom. On his 36th birthday, a couple rude cousins tricked Chef into going to a strip club. They blindfolded him, stuffed him into a Prius, and promised a steakhouse. He was inside an establishment named Bumpin' Uglies before he could morally object. Chef saw nudity, which bubbled sin in his genitals, which sent sin gnawing into his fingernails, which sent him to the bar. To avoid temptation, he spent $80 on a steak and three beers. He sat at the bar the entire night, no matter how often his cousins begged him to join the party. When the cousins dropped him off at his apartment at 2 a.m., the infrequent drinker was drunk loaded with cholesterol, and shamefully erect. Chef broke into tears. I hate this stupid body. It's a temple of sin. I'm done with it. He decided he would never again let a sack of meat compromise his eternal life. But before he enacted his plan, he consulted a priest. Hello, Father. It has been 12 days since my last confession. Go ahead, child. Jesus said if your right hand causes you to sin, you must cut it off. Powerful words. But, but what if your left hand causes you to sin as well? Would God want you to lose both hands? If they lead you to sin, for better for one part of ye perish than the whole thing. But, but what if your whole body causes you to sin? Chef, that's what the body does. That's why we're free of our earthly bodies in heaven, cleansed and pure, so we can enjoy beatific vision, the, the perfect union with our Lord God. Chef smiled. That's what I thought. <laughs> Thank you, Father. Just so you know, this is probably the last time you'll ever see me. Chef's smile stretched until it hurt his mouth. I'm never going to sin again. The surgeon met Chef for a 10 a.m. consultation. What can I do you for? He asked with a friendly handshake. Hi, I would like to amputate my body, please. The surgeon laughed because he had never met someone so brave. When Chef did not laugh in kind, his features turned stony. My God, you're serious, aren't you? I am, and don't use the Lord's name in vain. The surgeon paced back and forth, hands rubbing through his thin hair. I never thought I'd actually get to do one. Y you know, the cost will bankrupt you. If a bank account stands between me and heaven, let it go. The surgeon sat down, impressed by Chef's faith. So, uh, what? You, you want the whole body gone? Leave the head? Chef stomped his foot. The head is part of the body! If it's not the soul, it has to go! The surgeon winked. A smart lad indeed. So, uh, what then? Everything except the brain? Or are we keeping the heart, too? Chef shook his head. He had seen enough popular movies and done well in high school biology. He knew the brain was the whole deal. 
I know what I want. Let me be a brain so I might finally touch God. In the same town at the same time, a young man of no particular religious faith worked at an industrial laundromat. His name was Dunstan Chexon, and for the time being, he had an IQ of 92. The supervisor was out to lunch when Dunstan fell into the dryer. Most people would have died, but with the dryer set on delicates and filled with restaurant napkins, Dunstan avoided both the extreme heat and fractures inflicted on other dryer fatalities. His brain, however, was not so lucky. Though cushioned from the blunt metal tumbler, his brain sloshed inside his skull for an hour until it vibrated into a pink stew. When his co-workers finally realized someone had fallen into the dryer and pulled Dunstan free, what remained of his brain leaked out his ear canals and left nostril. In an hour, his IQ dropped 90 points. Medical professionals assessed Dunstan. His brain had completely dripped from his skull, the hollow whistling with every breeze through his ears like a pan flute. The doctors declared him dead. Dunstan did not honor their diagnosis. As they filled out his death certificate, Dunstan walked into the cafeteria, ate a sandwich, and drank a seltzer. When a doctor tried to corner him in the hall shouting, you're supposed to be dead, Dunstan jumped through a window to the parking lot outside. He ran all the way to the laundromat, where he finished a productive shift to the supervisor's praises. Wowee, Dunstan, you're a laundromat rock star. After work, he returned to his father's home, watched TV, and chuckled at young Sheldon's empty promises before drifting into a dreamless, content sleep. When the doctors finally wrangled Dunstan back in for a follow-up, the medical establishment exploded. There were hundreds of papers written on Dunstan, referred to as Patient D in the literature. Journals declared him the new millennium's Phineas Gage, an anomaly whose very existence changed the field of neuroscience. Much focus was paid on how he still slept, an activity scientists used to believe was by, for, and of the mind. The body was an integrated machine, as Patient D illustrated, capable of quite a bit of thought without so much as a neuron. The brain, they learned, wasn't such a hot shot after all. In time, the lack of a brain did make one physical change to Dunstan's appearance. Without a squishy occupant, his skull began to dehydrate like a Cheerio left on the floor. A depression appeared on top of the cranium and sank until you could eat a bowl of chili out of the divot. He began wearing hats, which as scientists discovered, could be desired even without a brain. Another breakthrough. Dunstan didn't care about the revolutions he inspired. He just did laundry and watched young Sheldon every day as though waiting for what would come. The anesthesiologist put Chef under, and a team of surgeons began the careful work of removing his entire body. First to go were the legs. This was the easiest of the operations, requiring only the OR equivalent of a table saw. The team moved to the next stop on the body, removing the penis and testicles, which the lead surgeon shook around like a pair of maracas. He knew how to have fun. Next was Dunstan's butt, belly, and rib cage, which the surgeon left to his inferiors while he ate a sandwich. Once everything south of the heart was removed, the surgeon woke Chef for the final operations. They needed him conscious as they began disentangling the brain from the cage of the body to monitor he was, in fact, still Chef. Though groggy, he woke in absolute satisfaction. The devil, he's... He's gone! He gagged through his breathing tube. That's what happens when you remove a man's penis and feet. The surgeon smiled. He would normally rub a patient's shoulders to express his pleasure, but instead patted Chef's neck like he was a friendly Labrador. Now, the eyes. The surgeon and his team popped out Chef's eyeballs with a tool not unlike an ice cream scoop. Just need some cherries for a sundae. He said, and everyone chuckled. The atmosphere was literally disarming. 
Okay, here's the big one. A team of two surgeons took turns hammering at Chef's skull like it was a railroad spike. Sparks flew with each swing. Crack! Crack! The bone fell away and the brain could finally breathe, so to speak. Despite losing his entire face just by his brain self, Chef radiated joy. A couple nurses carried Chef's brain to a 10-gallon fish tank they bought at PetSmart and filled it with oxygen-saturated water. My goodness, I'm finally free, Chef thought. Thank you, doctor. Thank you, thank you, thank you. But the surgeon could not hear Chef because his lips were in the trash can, along with his teeth, tongue, toes, and life savings. The procedure cost an astronomical sum, though the finance department reassured Chef his expenses post-surgery would be greatly reduced. One less mouth to feed. The surgery team set Chef up with a number of tools for navigating the world sans body. He was relieved to know a boutique sector of the tech market existed to profit on his needs. A synthetic ear was plugged into the temporal lobe, though he could only afford one, so he lost stereo sound. A representative from the company Sit in Talk came by in person to insert two pins like meat thermometers into his superior temporal gyrus and his left inferior frontal gyrus. Let's give it a test, the rep said, tapping the power button on the screen affixed to the front of Chef's tank. Chef, can you hear me? Static buzzed in the void of Chef's sightless, touchless mind. He could just barely discern words. Not quite, he thought. It's there, but it hurts to hear it. Yes, the screen flashed. Easy peasy. The rep grinned and packed up his briefcase. Don't go, Chef thought in a panic. Oh, sound is agony. The machine flashed one word. Goodbye. Dunstan Chexon knew delights deeper than he had ever imagined before. The ecosystem of bacteria in his stomach no longer had to compete with the whims of a fickle brain and pumped his body with high doses of serotonin. His threshold for pleasure was significantly reduced. Just eating a good piece of ham was enough to earn a dry, full-body orgasm, and a bit of roast beef gave him two O's in a row. Coworkers who used to dislike Dunstan now found him irresistible. Every lunch break, friends and admirers surrounded him, patting his shoulder and demanding tricks. Do a somersault, someone would shout. And Dunstan, without any hesitation, would tumble over the lunch table and land in a perfect dismount. Physical actions came to Dunstan with the grace of a savant. Tap dance! And Dunstan would clap his shoes until Fred Astaire's distant coffin knew shame. His body finally made sense without a brain, though it was not without a hiccup here or there. Balance a fork on your nose! A woman pressed a fork into Dunstan's palm, and he threw it like a dart into an HR cork board. Everyone gasped, then started clapping. On occasions like this, Dunstan's mouth could still articulate the stray word or two. Bullseye! Satisfaction eluded Jeff, though at first the freedom from sin was enough to bring metaphorical tears to his metaphorical eyes, his thoughts and emotions were no longer the same. Without the microcosm of the gut, happiness lacked a certain resolve. He'd listened to the choir at mass, and the best he felt was a sense of non-pressing annoyance. Hearing amazing grace felt like a rock stuck in a shoe. As the newness of disembodied living faded, Chef found it near impossible to sleep. When he did, he always dreamed about running, eating food, or having sex, activities he detested before. There were traitors within the brain, he realized. He would need another surgery. Chef prayed for dreamless sleep, but prayer did not come as easy as it used to. He'd start strong, but lose conviction. Dear God in heaven, it is in your most holy name I... <sighs> Chef thought prayer was about talking to God, but he learned a big part of it was folding your hands. He never realized 
but he loved the satisfaction of wrangling them. The hands were his biggest sinners, and making them pray was like taming a wild, sinful horse. But it was deeper than that, just bowing a head, bending a knee, all of it was a kind of dance to invoke God. Lost in the dark of his mind, he couldn't see where God hid. He asked his father for a cross necklace. If they sunk it in the tank, he thought, the cross could be his lightning rod to God. But the translator couldn't decode his thoughts. God crossing! It blinked God like an crossing. abstract road God sign. Crossing. His aquarium God went crossing. unadorned. Worst of all, Chef's inclination to sin did not disappear. After the shock of those first two weeks, his mind conceived of ways to affront God. The simple pornographic thoughts that used to haunt his mind mutated. They turned alien and nauseatingly abstract swirls of non-color in incorporeal quivers. Some days, Chef didn't feel like a human being, could no longer remember flesh, felt no connection to the goofy characters he used to love in radio ads. The sit-and-talk rep visited Chef after a month for a check-in. How's it going? Any problems with the hardware? Chef could not control his thoughts. They blasted ten at a time like a crowd of trumpets playing different songs. God in heaven, I need something more. I remember touch. Leave me, don't leave me. And his screen flashed, goodbye. It was a coincidence that Chef and Dunstan lived in the same city. It was fate that led them to meet. Chef's translator had failed him again. He wanted to tell his father that he dreamed he could breathe. He didn't hate it this time. Within the dream, in an imagined body, he found calm. For what felt like hours, he listened to the sound of his lungs, followed the muscles moving, the rhythms they made in a song with no end. The translator screen condensed this into three words. I want muscles! The father wasn't sure what this meant, but he wanted to do his best to honor his son. He loaded Chef's aquarium into a baby seat and drove to the YMCA. At the same time, Dunstan's co-workers were setting up at the YMCA track to settle a bet. I'm telling you, he can run a mile in 330. And I'm telling you, he can't. No one can, brain or no brain. Dunstan stretched in his athleisure on one of the basketball courts inside the ring of the track, well in view of the lobby, where Chef's father scanned his membership card. The father watched as Dunstan ran back and forth. There was a beauty in his movement, something natural he had never seen in a human, more like a horse's gallop than a sprint. If you want muscles, that'll do. The father carried Chef's tank like a crock pot to the basketball court and set it down. It was then, in an act of fate, his enlarged prostate pressed on his bladder. The bathroom was just outside the track. <laughs> don't go anywhere. A whistle shrieked down on the track. All right, Dunstan, wait for my command. Ready, set, go! The co-workers cheered as Dunstan exploded into a run. He whipped around the first corner so fast he tilted over like a motorcycle taking a curve. He zoomed through the next corner and burst down the back half of the track. His co-workers jumped and hollered, My God, he's going to do it! Somewhere, Chef heard the crackle of someone taking the Lord's name in vain. The brain in the tank swayed back and forth as though shaking its head. With that motion, Dunstan's eyes turned to the aquarium. The yearning was immediate. Dunstan wanted Chef's brain the way a magnet wants iron. Dunstan did not slow his sprint, but changed his aim. He ran for the aquarium. By the time the co-workers noticed the change in course, he was too close. They ran for him, afraid he might trip over the obstacle and lose the world record. 
all Chef heard was crashes of thunder booming closer and closer. He didn't need eyes to sense a warm presence coming nearer, the kind of sensation that made the devil whisper, do it again, Chef. An angel, a storm, a stranger coming to claim me. Help, help me, help, help. And the screen just flashed, goodbye. Dunstan's left foot crashed through the glass of the tank, while his right kicked the brain in a spray of suds, tubes, and aquarium rocks. The laundromat worker shouted in alarm, thinking Dunstan had just killed someone's pet jellyfish? Sea cucumber? They didn't expect it was a living human brain, Dunstan punted, and then toppled over. The brain and body twisted together as they fell. The brain and the body's arms, the ends of Chef's heat prongs stuck in Dunstan's chest. Sensation flooded Chef's mind, the heat of a body. Vicariously, he could feel for an instant the pulsing of a heart, the ASMR churn of a stomach. The lights turned on in dormant parts of his mind. Joy returned in a flash, a joy as pure as an infant drinking high fructose corn syrup. Transcendence, he thought. I have risen beyond isolation in the hands of another body. What beauty, what peace. The co-workers watched Dunstan climb to his feet, gently cradling the pink, glistening brain to his chest. A kind of reverence shushed them. Not a sound broke the meeting of the body and the brain. What is your name? Chef implored. Tell me, who are you, beautiful stranger, and why do you allure me? His screen, hooked up via Bluetooth several feet away, flashed, mm-mm. Dunstan lifted the brain up, looking at it with vacant eyes. A young romantic among the co-workers held her breath, certain they would kiss. Dunstan slammed the brain to the cement with a throaty, Woo-hoo! All five of the co-workers screamed. The monitor flashed a string of nonsense characters. As the brain squished back up in the air, Dunstan slapped it down again with all his might so it bounced down the court. Stop him! screamed the young romantic. The five co-workers took their places on the court, trying to block Dunstan as he dribbled the brain forward. The romantic tried to steal the brain, but Dunstan spun around her with a hoo-hoo. He slipped between two more, his feet dancing, chest swaying with nary a double dribble. With every bounce, Chef howled internally with such intense pain that all players could hear a high-frequency hum blasting into their brains like 5G. The last two tried to catch Dunstan by the hoop. Tongue lolling out of his mouth, Dunstan's body leaped over them, arm outstretched with the brain clasped in his palm. It was at this moment Chef's father returned from the bathroom, his hands unwashed. Bullseye! Dunstan's mouth screamed. He slammed Jeff's brain down through the basket. Ah! He roared, dangling from the rim with both hands. The onlookers all stared in slack-mouthed spectacle. Ah! The brain flowed silk-like through the net in a triumphant swish as the backboard shattered. For a serene moment, Chef was flying. He had slowly suffocated outside the tank and was now floating in an oxygen-deprived euphoria. He was free from a body, free from gravity, free from sin, free, free, free! Spiraling as he descended, all who witnessed could see every inch of the brain. It truly was an impressive organ. It had a certain esteem to its bumps and ridges, like it ought to be wearing glasses or a bow tie. At the other court, a mother and son playing a pickup game paused to behold Dunstan's breakaway. They jumped and cheered for their fellow athletes. What a game! Despite the punting and dribbling, Chef could still hear their staticky praise. As the sun set through the windows of the YMCA, 
he shone. The brain had no way to sense the nearness of the approaching floorboards, but the creases in Chef's gray matter somehow looked joyous as the brain kissed the ground and then splattered into jelly like a fat tick in a fire or a water balloon full of salsa. A rain of plexiglass chunks twinkled down on his mess like confetti. The co-workers were silent. The mom and kid still cheering. Chef's father made a whoopsie face and backtracked into the bathroom. Cracked on the running track, Chef's translation screen read half of its usual response. Good.